Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. It's 11.30, so we want to go ahead and get started. Um, as we do get started, just want to uh, establish how things are going to work today. Uh, we do have a panel assembled of uh, architects, engineers, um, and other experts uh, who will be introduced in a moment by uh, Brandon Graham of uh, Rains Company. Uh, the one person that he might not be as familiar with is Gary Pope. Uh, who is serving as the uh, city's attorney on this matter um, and will be representing us uh, legally. Um, beyond that, are there any, um, and I see there are some, want to make sure to introduce or at least have uh, any council members uh, raise your hand if you're here in attendance so folks know where you are. Um, any DRB members that are with us? Any commissioners? Okay. Up here, we have a couple. All right, so um, so those folks are there just so you recognize and, and realize who's here. Um, just our guidelines that we typically uh, get into, um, just want to read over those. Meetings are public forums in which many opinions are expressed and the business of the city must be conducted. As such, disciplined, honorable, and professional decorum is paramount. Courteous and respectful communication is required. During the public comment period of the meeting, all questions and statements from the public shall be directed to the moderator. That's me. Uh, if you wish to speak, raise your hand and the moderator will recognize you. Please approach the podium and state your name and your address. Uh, each person may speak only once during the meeting and we'll have three minutes to address the panel with any comments or questions. Um, today we intend to provide a safe and respectful space for everyone to exp express their opinions, which are very important to this process. Um, there will be no rebuttals or any comments from this seat or from this panel. Um, your comments are your own and uh, none of them will be argued with today. Um, if you have questions, uh, the request is that, or the rule is, uh, that you ask your question. If you have a series of questions, you ask the series of questions, we will note those. Then you'll be asked to return to your seat and the panel will answer the question uh, in the order that they were received. So those are pretty much the, the ground rules for today. And then the logistics of how we're going to do this is we do have uh, brief presentations from the architects uh, concerning the various elements um, of the project and the site plan as it stands today. Uh, a caveat that we need to add to this is that this is the latest iteration uh, of a plan that has gone through many iterations. Um, I've had some of these gentlemen pulling their hair out and working late nights because uh, when we do have input, uh, we've had five uh, work sessions with the DRB that have been very involved and there's been significant um, input uh, that has been shared on initial site plans, designs, and every aspect of this project, um, which has required a new iteration of this work in progress. Um, today is no different. Uh, we do have uh, the easels out in the hall that you're free to peruse. Um, I heard someone ask, is it okay if we take pictures? Yes, take pictures. Uh, we want you to, to kind of soak it in and know what you're looking at. We want to know what your feedback is, and that's going to make this a, a much better project as we move forward. Um, so we'll have those three presentations uh, so that we make sure that we all understand what the plans are. Um, and uh, we'll have some information on the, the parking availability and the band that's anticipated. Uh, so we want to get all of those presentations in. Um, I've asked the presenters to keep those to about 12 to 15 minutes and then following each uh, when the presentation portion is done, we'll open it for public comment and questions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brandon to make some introductions and we'll get started with these presentations. Thank you. Brandon Graham, Rains Company, Rains Development. Um, I'll start with a brief intro statement and then we'll get directly into the introductions and presentations. Um, first, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here in Aiken, um, be involved in such an incredible opportunity. 
Most of us with Reigns and our partners have some history or familiarity with this city and can appreciate the unique opportunity to contribute to its downtown. Continued evolution and place gathering and hopefully strengthening of a sense of the center, city center. As I mentioned, I'm Brandon Graham. If you've been following this project, you've probably heard from myself and my counterpart, Jay Ham, with Reigns. While the beginnings of this project started long before, we have been presenting to various entities, as Tim mentioned, since early January of this year. Gray Rains, one of our managing partners and myself, were able to meet with community leaders as well as the Design Review Board the first week of January. So we've been here, um, been trying to present, trying to get feedback from the beginning. Ray Massey, one of our local partners with an RPM development partner, Partners was also instrumental in these meetings and early involvement of the project. Can't be stressed enough that while we are not from Macon, we have a sincere desire to deliver a product that we are all proud of and can stand the test of time for the next generation. Along with our partner Lap Purser and Associates, we have local partners that live here and are long-term real estate holders and investors. LP and, and Reigns will manage these assets and will employ associates that live and thrive here and create their own lives and memories in downtown Aiken. While at the time of these initial meetings we had no definitive plans to present, we had a vision and a goal to produce something the community could be proud of. From those initial meetings in January, our very talented design partners have worked hard to produce and revise numerous iterations of an ever-evolving conceptual remembrance. While we remain proud of these first iterations, some of which you will see today, we have listened to the Design Review Board, City Council, and others, and have pivoted accordingly to produce what we feel in the end is a better overall design for downtown Aiken. We want to thank the DRB for their time and feedback to date, and we have presented these plans in their forum publicly now at least four times, as Tim mentioned, five times. Again, we're excited and honored to be here today to present a progress update of our design efforts and look forward to your input, feedback, questions and conversation. This is not the end of our design efforts, yet a critical point of the project's evolution as we take into account all various feedback and ideas. We can go to that first slide. So as far as the introduction is concerned, you know, that's kind of our project timeline to date to talk about what we've done, kind of where we've been, DRB, City Council, etc. Um, we're going to first start with a brief um, touch on Reigns as a company. Um, Jay Ham, as I mentioned earlier, um, we'll do that. We will go straight into the master site plan and we will let Stephen Overcash, raise your hand Stephen, with ODA Architecture. He'll go into that, talk about some of the elements of, of where we've come from, some of that evolution of that site plan. We'll go straight from there into the multifamily presentation. Again, some of the things where we've started, where we've gotten to. Um, Jack Levinson of LPA, Lat Person Associates, and Russell Vita of FMK will present that. Um, then we will go in, back into the hotel presentation, back to ODA, Stephen Overcash. Again, it's, uh, it'll be, I hope, uh, very good to see where we started and uh, the feedback we received to date so we can go into some of those details. Um, and then we'll go into the conference center slash activity presentation, still again with Stephen Overcash. And then we'll go into Newberry Street Festival Center realignment. Um, Jennifer Bill of Bill Engineering will uh, take the first approach and then Lance Cheeley and Dennis Welch of Cranston Engineering will go from there. Um, some exciting media to share with that that we feel like is really going to bring things home to understand the idea, the vision, direction of, of what we feel is a good thing there. So this is just a brief summary um, so you can see, uh, again, the team members that are involved, the design professionals, etc. Um, we've pretty much covered that. And I'll let Jay take over from here. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, my name is Jay Ham. I'm the Senior Vice President of Development for Reigns Company. I've been with the Reigns for approximately 10 years. Uh, Brandon and I have been working together either as uh, joint venture partners or along at Reigns for probably the last six years. Um, he and I are both responsible for the overall development 
of all commercial and hospitality projects within the Raines family. Um, the Raines family have, has been involved in hospitality development for over 30 years. Um, we currently have 21 hotels in our portfolio uh, from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, representing all major brands from Wyndham, Marriott, Hyatt, Hilton, um, I think that's all of them. Uh, within that portfolio of 21 hotels, uh, we currently have two historic boutique hotels, um, both of which Brandon and I have been involved in, and we are currently almost ready to start construction on our third historic renovation in North Carolina. Um, very similar to what we are trying to attempt here is the evaluation of the existing buildings. We look at all the different funding sources from state tax credits, historic tax credits, mill credits, job creation credits. We put all of those into our thought on whether the building, its current state, is worth saving. Uh, hotel Florence was an existing hotel was built as a hotel, but in order to make it feasible, we had to acquire three other buildings to get the room count where it needed to be. Um, the Foundry Hotel in Asheville was not a hotel, but again, it is multiple buildings that were combined into one to get the room count to where we needed it. Um, the current Hotel Cherry in Wilson, North Carolina, is a historic tax credit project for us. It involves state credits, historic credits, and federal credits. It will be a hundred rooms. When we were asked to look at the Hotel Aiken, obviously we're excited. We do a lot of historic renovation. We know the process. We understand it. Um, we ask our architect, uh, Stephen Overcash, to come down and give his evaluation. And it was obvious that First, first look inside the building that we need to have a structural analysis on. Our structural engineers came down and gave their opinion. Um, their opinion was, yes, the building can be saved, but at great cost. Um, at that point, we looked at all the additional funds that may be available through tax credits. And again, tax credits, while they are great, they are very expensive projects and they will limit you to what you can do on the inside of the building to the existing structure and historically what is there and what still remains. That being said, the Hotel Aiken, once we try to redesign it, once we try to, his, to structurally repair it, does not give us either the room count or the upgraded amenities that we feel Today's Traveler wants and Downtown Aiken wants. Um, again, like Brandon said, we are not here to tell you what we think Aiken needs. We're here to listen to you and to provide what Aiken needs. Um, so again, that's our, our brief history of Reigns, our, our experience with renovations. Um, again, we own and manage all of our hotels. Um, very rarely, if ever, do we sell one. So we want to be part of the Aiken community for a long time. We want to be proud of the hotel that we ultimately build, and we appreciate your input. So as Stephen kind of gets ready to go through the master plan, we included this, and, and we actually kept, this was one of uh, FMK's presentations. Um, in one of the design review board meetings of the Aiken streetscape and we loved it so much to to at least show it again to to see that you know everyone's trying to draw inspiration of uh, from all of the great things that you have now and and, and an extension of those <clears throat> whether it be a Newberry you know extension of the alley etc um, we really took great pride and time in trying to look at some of these design elements um, and this was just a natural segue to, to, to reintroduce this going into the master plan 
as you can see, is what we're trying to do to tie everything in, um, the different components of the overall design. Stephen, if you could step over to the microphone over here, the folks in the overflow can hear. That's right. That's, that's, I, I, I forgot all about the overflow. But anyway, so we're trying to reestablish the green space back uh, on Newberry with the, with the promenade. Uh, it will be uh, reduced. We are reestablishing the parking. Uh, I was a little disappointed. It was originally the, the event center was going to be freestanding. It was going to be the next block. And then they started talking about... Uh, we're reducing the amount of infringement on Newberry and adding on to this building, the municipal building, which I know everybody loves. They had a, a great architect that designed it. And the more I got into it, I think it is the perfect solution. Uh, you can see I got my point here. The part right there is we're sitting right in that building right there, two story, and now we're going to give it a frontage onto uh, Newberry. Uh, this will be the event center. In addition, uh, we'll make sure we design it to complement the original building. Uh, we're leaving the retail buildings that are there facing the alley now. We're going to come up with some sort of unique retail space, garden shop or coffee shop or something just to kind of give an end cap to that building and keep this whole concept of the, of the park running through there. Uh, we've got these uh, apartments, uh, which uh, the other group like LTA will uh, it does have plenty of parking. It has enough parking to, to feed pretty much the whole development. The hotel guests will stay in this, this deck. Uh, if you're going to a, an event, you can pull in that deck or you can park in the street. This is exciting. Uh, B Lane uh, is a, a neat little, neat little uh, street. It's very, it's very small. It's like 18 feet wide. We're going to widen it and turn it into a more of a street. Stephen, like Stephen, I hate to interrupt you. Um, but it's really important they hear you when you turn your head. Oh, I'm 
dogs are. Um, they can. Okay. Yeah. So I apologize. Uh, so B Lane will be improved. It'll be streetscaped with trees, sidewalks, pavers, and what it's going to do if you if you live here or if you're staying at the hotel, uh, you'll be able to just walk right down the alley to enjoy all the uh, the uh, restaurants and the activity that you've already got of uh, art shops in the alley. And the last component is the hotel. Uh, it's going back uh, where the original hotel was on the corner. Uh, it's going to have a strong streetscape. We're going to engage all these streets with activities. So if you go by at night, right now it's sort of dead because a lot of the uh, uh, buildings are, are not, not active. But now all of this will be lit up at night. You'll be able to see the activity. And we're going to have a really nice rooftop uh, garden on the hotel that anybody, you don't have to be a hotel guest, anybody can go up, enjoy the view, enjoy the sunset, uh, and have a drink. So that's pretty much an overview. And we'll move on to the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Levinson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Lap Person Associates based in Charlotte. I want to thank Brandon and Jay, the Reigns Development Group, for inviting us to be a part of this exciting project and, and work uh, diligently on this. Uh, Lap Person Associates uh, is in Charlotte with offices in Raleigh and Jacksonville. Uh, the company has been in operation for 62 years. It's family owned by the uh, Lap Purser family. Uh, I've been there for 36 years. Uh, we have both the commercial uh, division and the multifamily division. Uh, in the commercial side, we have approximately 40 uh, commercial properties, mainly grocery anchor shopping centers. Uh, in the multifamily side, we have um, approximately 21 uh, assets in that uh, division. Uh, some of the properties that I wanted to just highlight today for you that are relevant to, to what we're looking at here in downtown Aiken is uh, we've done uh, a project near here in the medical district in Augusta. Uh, we're located across the street from University Hospital. Our entry point into our multifamily aligns with the stoplight and entry into University Hospital. Uh, we have um, two projects in downtown Rock Hill, South Carolina. Uh, we have a project in downtown Florence. We have a project that's going to open in a couple months in downtown Spartanburg. And uh, we're working on, and we did a project in downtown Matthews, which is a connection for our firm and Stephen Overcash because Stephen was the architect for that. Uh, with, with me today uh, is our uh, folks from FMK. We do a lot of work on the multifamily front with FMK. Uh, Rusta Vita will be speaking just momentarily. He's a principal with FMK. And Pete, Peter Rivera uh, is, uh, is uh, heavily involved in this project as well. He's joined us here today. Um, so at this time, I want to invite uh, Russ to give some uh, more detailed description of what we are proposing or what we have been working on in the past few months. Oh, sorry. Yep. And Russ, if, if you want to stand where you can face the audience, you can actually pull that microphone back towards you, I believe. So you can both face in the amplifier. Thanks, Jack. Uh, my name is Russ DeVita with FMK Architects. And uh, like Jack had mentioned, we've, we've done uh, several projects together here recently. Um, a couple of projects in downtown uh, Rock Hill. Uh, very similar small downtown um, feels. And this is when I first came here to to Aiken, I was I was really taken by the, the scale and the architecture and the, the surroundings and just really fell in love with with this downtown. Um, I'm just super excited and, and was really honored to, to be able to be a part of this project. Um, like Brandon was was showing earlier, we we made it a point to walk around all the lovely streets and kind of take notice of the architecture, the scale of the buildings, um, kind of what makes Aiken special. And, uh, and again, th just this, this block in particular is, is, is really uh, something special rel 
with that with the pedestrian alley that's there and, and the pot the potential to to create connectivity around the entire block and and create a really thriving, exciting multi-use project. Um, so with that, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a perspective of the mixed-use um, residential component. This is from our original uh, design review board presentation that we made uh, several weeks ago. Um, this is viewed from the corner of, of Richland and Newberry, Richland being in the foreground. The, the first floor is, is, is a commercial retail, um, and then there's apartments above. The, in the center of that slide, you can see this is the existing C.C. Johnson facade that we're, we're really excited to be able to preserve, and not only the facade itself, but also to to be able to retell the history of, of that building. Um, so, and again, as you can see with the, we, we took a lot of notes from the architecture, you know, in Aiken and we incorporate that into just the variety of how we're dealing with the, the windows and, and the different openings and, and how we're dealing with the streetscape, trying to get a lot of activity uh, along that, that, at that scale, at that pedestrian scale. Um, but we also heard th through the process we all we also received some really valuable feedback and so we can go to the next slide kind of take you through uh, how we're moving forward um, like Stephen indicated you know we're, we're really excited about it's always a process of discovery and, and getting great feedback and, and and making changes and making updates that, that create a better plan and we're we're super excited about this plan because it's 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 really um, become with the conference center moving off the site across the alley over here. It's allowed the mixed use piece and the parking enough enough space to really a create a, a very usable parking deck with more parking, which was needed. We heard very frequently also with. The parking deck now has flat plates, but also we're now able to, to have residential around the entire parking deck, thus, thus screening the entire parking deck. And, and it's so important to have those residential units along the entire perimeter of the building just because that, that's what brings that engagement to all, all sides of the project, especially along B Lane and the, the B Lane extension here. Um, the, probably the, the biggest moves we made since our last presentation are relative to Newberry Street. Originally, this the building spanned another, came out another 30 feet, and so we've we've since pushed our building back 30 feet off Newberry to allow, as you'll see later in the presentation, this uh, this Newberry uh, dart, you know this. This, this greenery to come all the way down, this promenade to come all the way down and all the way to Richland. So we've, we've pushed our building back 30 feet here. Um, the other big thing we did is originally we had the facade that runs over the existing C.C. Johnson. We had that pushed back five feet. We've, we've now taken that our entire facade, including that facade, and pushed it back an additional five feet. So now our building is pushed back 10 feet off of Richland. Um, and again, we, we pulled it back off Newberry as well. But what we heard is that was really important because our, our original corner of our building would be around here and it was just becoming, at that scale, it's just becoming too, too tight at the corner of Richland and Newberry. And now by pushing our building back, it's really, allowed that area to kind of breathe and allowed this park, the streetscape, to, to come all the way down uh, to Richland. Also, the, the other big uh, change that we did is we, we originally had our lobby and leasing at this corner, um, but a, a combination of things, um, by pushing our building back an additional five feet to create this relief, what we're able to do is really express the corner 
of that existing C.C. Johnson building. So it's, even though it's not physically at the corner, that corner has the same prominence uh, that it does now. And the idea is to make that the lobby and leasing for the apartments, uh, and as well as the amenity spaces. And what, what we're really excited about there is that's going to allow us to not only better preserve the, the historic part of the facade of that building, but we're going to be able to tell the story uh, of that building, of the C.C. Johnson building, because it's going to be part of the lobby and leasing of the apartments. You know, so it'll be able to tell the broader story. Um, and I think that's much, originally we had some live work units there, but those would just, at that point we just have a facade, but now we're gonna be able to not only keep that facade, but, but to be able to tell the rich history of, of that building. Um, so we're really excited about that. The, the other thing that allows us to do is we're, we're now able to, to put a, a commercial retail space here, which we think is really important because obviously as your B lane as it extends all the way up here, it's, you know, you have the mellow mushroom and you have all that activity and it connects with the alley. But now we're going to be able to bring all that activity and anchor it with another retail space here and the hotel being over here. So like Stephen mentioned, making this a much wider sidewalk so that this becomes a real, we really now connect both the pedestrian alley and B lane to the, to the four main surrounding streets and really create, you know, we, we connect the entire site, which is going to be really exciting. Um, we're also bringing a B lane extension down here that would be used for service. We'll have a loading area here for loading and service. Um, the parking deck will be accessed off of B Lane here and off this service alley here. So you'd be able to come down Newberry Street into the parking deck here, come down Richland Street into the parking deck here. Uh, the parking deck, we're able, since the site increased in size, we're able to get, I think we have 380 spaces, but more importantly, we're able to have a very straightforward uh, two way speed ramp that takes you from level to level, and then all the surrounding parking is on a flat plate. And so that both helps with the visitor experience, but also helps that all these levels will be lined up with the, uh, the multifamily levels above. So it just makes for easy access in and out. We'll have the um, elevators for the elevators and the stairs for the parking deck here and the stair. Um, oh well, there goes the corner. But anyway, We'll have another, oh there it goes, we'll have another stair there for the parking deck, but again that'll allow for easy in and out for visitors who are at the hotel or are going to the conference center. Um, next slide please. And then this just shows levels two through five. Um, again it'll be residential units around the entire perimeter which will be really fantastic. It'll really create streets you want to be on and part of and very walkable environment all the way around. We're planning to have a club room amenity space at the fifth floor at this corner, similar to what was shown on the rendering. Um, and again, I think what's through this process of discovery and feedback, what's, what's happening now is on our previous iterations, we've always had one open side of the parking deck, but now what I think is probably the most one of the more exciting parts is we'll have residential units along here. So literally when you're looking out this window over the roof of that existing retail, you'll see residential units, people living right there, uh, being able to look down on this, the alley. So it's just gonna, it's just gonna pray for such a, a really rich and exciting uh, environment. Again, place where you're gonna wanna walk down all these sidewalks and interconnect. Uh, next slide, please. This is the a street section through Richland Avenue, and we've modified this since our last presentation. So here you can see this is the existing facade line of the C.C. Johnson building right now. And as you can see, it's, it's fairly tight to the curb line. We've taken our entire building. 
facade to the to the the main facade of our building is anywhere from 10 to to, to seven feet back but um this allowed us again to to put a apartment units right above on the second level and still have a nice private terrace space behind the existing parapet and and like we discussed earlier move the the lobby and leasing function into that that space um, next slide please and then this would be uh, a section through Newberry Street this is where again our building used to be out here where this tree is we we pushed it back 30 feet so now we have this this really incredible 60 foot wide uh, sidewalk that you'll see later in the presentation is, is this going to be this great extension all along Newberry creating this just wonderful uh, festival and streetscape environment. Um, you can see the parking how it's aligned at each level and it's flat plate like we discussed uh, and that allowed us to get six levels of parking here. Um, another thing to note is because it's I think it's easy to kind of get um, when you hear five-story building I think it's easy to, to, to feel like that's really out of scale or really tall but what we have to remember is this is an accurate depiction of, of a two-story building an existing two-story building here the Aiken Center for the Arts and a, a very small actually one-story building here um, our building our floor to floors are much smaller than typical floor to floors in old town buildings for example many of these two-story buildings around here are might be 14 to 16 feet floor to floor so you're building from sidewalk to parapet may be 35 feet tall so it's important to, to note that our building although five stories is is 55 feet tall so it's again if you're looking out here and you the building is is beyond that roof there it's only going to be another 20 to 30 feet taller so relative to to scale it's we, we do feel it's much much in keeping with the the overall scale of the buildings in the historic downtown. Um, next slide, please. It's a, this one's a little dark, but this is this is just a, a quick um, view, as if you're standing at the corner of of Newberry and Richland, looking looking down Richland towards the hotel, uh, down towards Lawrence Street. But again, this is this is just showing how by pushing our building back an additional five feet. We're really starting to expose the corner uh, of the existing C.C. Johnson facade, and then that's really going to become this prominent location uh, for the lobby of the apartments, um, where we can really, again, preserve the history of, of the existing facade, bring it back to its original uh, uh, design, but then also be able to, to tell the story of the history of that building within the, the lobby and leasing. And then this in the foreground is you know, again, we'll have a great storefront opportunity for some great uh, retail space in the new apartments of that. Uh, final slide. This is kind of, if you just pivot and now look down Newberry Street at the corner, that same retail storefront, uh, but then again, this, this would be the, the retail as you go down Newberry. Plenty of room here for, for that if there were restaurants or whatever to spill out with outdoor seating and then have all the the, the, the trees and the, the, the garden that's going to be part of the uh, what Prance will be talking about uh, later. So that I believe that's the uh, the extent of the uh, mixed use multifamily. Thank you. Hotel that uh, we're proposing. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the, the hotel slides. It's uh, five stories. Uh, you can see the apartments beyond. It's the same height as the apartments that Russ was just describing. Uh, we've been working with the DRB and some, some other groups to uh, try to fine tune it. This was the, the original design that a lot of people uh, felt was a little too cold, too much glass at the top where we had this uh, rooftop bar. Uh, not enough brick, uh, just felt like it you know, works like a 
do contemporary uh, and that sort of stuff. So we spent a lot of time refining it. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, you can see as, after we started seeing how the apartments were coming out, we wanted to be at least a second cousin to the apartments. We certainly aren't trying to be apartments. The apartments aren't trying to be a hotel. Hotels are usually a little calmer, a little more sophisticated. Uh, we reduced glass. We started adding more brickwork. We added a, a, a good amount of brick. Um, but clearly, uh, the scale of each of those, those light verticals in keeping with the, uh, the scale of the town and the scale of the apartments, which are right next door. Spent a lot of time looking at how did it look from the street? I mean, anybody can look at a building from down the street, but what's most important is when you're walking down the street in the daytime or the nighttime, uh, how does it feel? We, like I said, we reduced the glass at the, uh, the rooftop bar. Next slide, it'll give you a, So here, here's an idea of you're at the corner uh, of Lawrence and Richland, and you're looking at the hotel. So that's, that's the scale. You've got street trees, you've got paving. Uh, we want you to be able to, to look into the hotel and see all the activity. Everything when you look through the windows, with the bar, the lounge, the lobby, uh, the event space, uh, your, everything will be engaged. So next slide, please. Uh, here's a nighttime shot. Uh, what does it look like when you're, when you're walking by at night? You can see every window will be lit up. And the good thing about hotels is they're, they're always lit up. Hotels never sleep. So lobby areas will always have lights on versus retail and restaurants, they, they close at 11 or 2 or whatever, office goes home at 5. The beauty of hotels is they bring a lot of safety and security uh, to towns because you have late nights of, of traffic and you have people, you see people, it just makes you feel safer. Uh, anybody walking down late night can feel safe knowing that your eyes inside that hotel watch them. So that's an idea of the uh, streetscape of that night. Um, we looked at it straight on from Lawrence. Um, as you can see, once again, we want a combination of uh, stucco. As you remember, the old hotel is still there. It's, it's all white. Uh, we certainly uh, wanted to warm it up with some brick. And then we started stepping down toward the, uh, the, the two-story uh, buildings on Lawrence Street. Uh, so the rooftop, it does have a terrace. Uh, you can see it over there on the right. And, we just intentionally started stepping on down. We have a great courtyard. We have a low, well, we have a loge on Lawrence. If you'll see it, there are porch, which will be great. It'll create shade. Uh, that is the west side, so people can sit there. They can go out and drink their coffee, have a have a glass of wine under cover uh, right there. The restaurant and bar will be right inside the door there. We have a major entrance from the intersection of uh, Lawrence um, and, and Richland. So people will be able to go in, enjoy a drink. We have a great courtyard. It's, uh, it's like a little hidden Charleston courtyard. You don't really know it's there, but once you know it's there, it's kind of it's kind of cute. You love to go out there with fire, fireplace and outdoor seating and, and tables. It'd be a great event place if somebody wanted to have a small reception or a, a wedding or something. Uh, but the scale of the windows, we wanted to respect the town. They're all, all your town windows are vertical. We wanted to maintain that. One thing that we really, really like about the old hotel, the existing, is the big windows. Uh, those rooms were very well lit up, and, and the reason was when it was built, they you know, didn't have as much electricity, and they didn't have uh, air conditioning, so they needed the big windows for cooling, but we wanted to reflect that, because there's nothing better that makes you feel better in a hotel room, but to have a lot of light and look out and see all the activity on, on Lawrence Street. And, um, Move on. Yeah, I wanted to jump in one second and say as we go to these next slides, I think it's important to note that we're about to move into the conference center, um, and this is the first time anybody has seen any of this today. Um, it, it was coming out now, and it's the first time that any at any of these meetings that we have collectively started to put all these pieces together. Um, and so it's important to see that publicly, and I think both Stephen and Russ have done such a good job talking about, but to reiterate the connectivity of these different components, and you know, we heard throughout DRB, um, you know, activating the streetscape and, and connectivity and all of these things that are that we can now start finally putting all these building blocks together, so everybody can see 
the entirety of the project and how these things work together. And even with this latest pivot of obviously moving the um, activity conference center, et cetera, meeting space to this building, you know, they've, they've given you a good representation of why that works, but uh, just wanted to mention that collectively as we go into these next slides. Thank you. I, I still love this slide. I, I wonder if we have the last slide. Um, but I think that, that's what's great. You always respect corners when urban planning, once again, as an art object. You really always want to celebrate your corners at intersections, and that's why we spent all this time and energy putting all of a lot of our goodies there, and on, on the top also. That's where the bar is uh, in that corner. Next slide. Let's move to the, uh, the the conference center. Remember where it is. You're looking at a, a rendering. There's the alley. We all love the alley. Um, and there's some some buildings here that will be demolished. We want to be, we want to respect the original building that we're all sitting in. We don't want to mimic it. We don't want to copy it. Uh, you never do that when you're designing an urban location, but you want to complement it. You want to respect it. You want to pick up on some some things that Will has started. I'm sorry, I don't know when it was built. I'm guessing 30s or 40s uh, from the look. Uh, but it's a wonderful building. And so this is the event center and we'll have an entrance from the alley, and we'll also have a formal entrance off of the promenade. So what you're seeing in all these these glass towers, and that's that's a motif that's on this building right now, uh, that that gabled in. But these are these are two stairwells that we're flanking. The reason is that well, why do we want to celebrate the stairwells? Well, the stairwells are great because you you, you keep them lit up at night, and you're having a fancy ball. Uh, somebody to go prom, or somebody's getting married and everybody's gonna use those stairs, the grand stairs, and so you can just sit out there and enjoy seeing people dressed up going up and down the stairs. We, of course, we have elevators, but we want, we want people to enjoy the promenade. So we've got a big balcony uh, terrace off of the pre-function area that people can spill out into with a glass of wine in their hand, see the trees, the promenade that Cranston's gonna show us some wonderful ideas. Uh, and, and then, um, you know, right now, this building does not engage the alley very well, the existing building. We are going to make sure that we line the alley with retail, restaurants, coffee shops, whatever, uh, but it's going to be full of activity, so it will have it feel safer. Uh, we've got canopies, we've got a whole line of, of retail there. We have, let's face it, we're con event centers, you have to have service. Service is always a challenge, but we think we've pretty well sort of hidden it. It's, uh, we've got some big doors. If you go to the next slide, I think you can maybe see it a little bit later than you really can. Uh, what we did is this building has two wonderful arches uh, down on Park Avenue, and that's where the fire trucks were. I'm sure they had big, big wooden arch doors. So for our service area, which is really sort of hidden because it's under this, this uh, loggia, uh, we've got, uh, you gotta have dumpsters, you gotta have, you gotta have places for trash and, and trucks. So we're going to have these uh, great arched uh, doors that will hide the service. It'll be closed off except when somebody's going there. And then we have the entrance from the promenade into the event center, which will also be a, a large arch. So once again, you don't want to mimic, but you want to respect a lot of this scale, a lot of these vertical windows you see. We would like to use the same green roof that's on this building. Uh, it's nice. It's uh, it's warm. It's friendly, and uh, we just feel like this is a it's it's more than it's more than a first cousin. It's more like a sibling to the municipal building, and we just felt that it was important to really respect it. We are touching it. They front different streets. They can have a little bit of their own character, um, but our, our concept was to have all this activity and people to see uh, in a pre-function. That's where all the people stand between events as they're out there in the pre-function. We wanted to open all that up with all of this glass. Luckily, all these windows are, are basic metal, so you can have as big of windows as possible. You don't pick up a lot of heat gain. Uh, and we respect the alley. So we're, we think we're strengthening the alley by adding now more retail. And then, of course, you see all the landscaping of the promenade, which I think uh, Pascal is going to would approve of. Stephen, yeah. if you wouldn't mind a, an assist real quick, and, and yes, uh, city folks just saw this uh, briefly before this meeting. Uh, it's been something, that, some feedback 
from DRB brought us to, and, and thank you for getting it to us so quickly. Um, but in your uh, description, you said buildings, plural, would be demolished, and I don't want any concerns to be raised by that. Um, there's one building. It is the um, is currently uh, the USC Aiken building that they're using for meetings over there. It's been called the bike shop. Uh, it's been called a number of things, and our uh, compactor is currently over there. So that is the one building. Of course, this uh, addition would go from Newberry Street all the way to the alley across from uh, New, uh, Mellow Mushroom. So there would be some uh, reorientation of this rear part of the building, um, but there would be no interference with the use of the patio, um, which has been a community-centered uh, facility for many years, or the treasured uh, police wall of the old police station. That really adds to the, the site plan. Yes. Now we love that. We're, we're maintaining all that back in this corner. Once again, you'll have two entrances. You can either park and come in uh, off of uh, Newberry, or you can walk down the alley and come in the back door, uh, which is where the, the police monument is that we, we will maintain. So thank you for reminding me of that. Okay. okay. Just very briefly, we're not going to spend a lot of time with the plans. It's it's, it's all going to be a function of uh, uh, whatever we need for the event center. Once again, here's the service area that you can see, the big arch doors that we'll hide. We want to hide all the uglies that we hidden in there. Um, Got to have uglies. That's just part of having a building. Here's where you came in probably a while ago. Here's the back entrance, which we're maintaining uh, with the police monument. Um, and this is the first floor, so all of this would be retail. Uh, this is McDonald's idea. I love it. He, he was nice enough to send me a sketch. Uh, he's, he's retired, but still so excited about this project that he's, uh, he's sending me sketches, and they were wonderful ideas. And I never thought about turning some of these spaces on the first floor, which we will no longer need because we, we'll probably have more square footage. And his idea was to activate this little minor alley with more retail. I thought that was wonderful. I loved his idea here is to reestablish those two big arches that were closed up. Originally they were arches because they were big I mean, uh, fire trucks back in there. But he thought if we took the, the windows out that were added later and just made an arch, what a cute little area for a coffee shop to sit out there and enjoy a cup of coffee before an event, before a town meeting. Uh, I thought that was great. So I, I really do appreciate uh, uh, McDonald being so uh, involved and so active sending ideas. Next slide is the upstairs. Uh, very briefly, uh, a ballroom was established that we needed a place for a banquet for about 350 people. Uh, that will accommodate that. It will have a large commercial kitchen. Uh, you'll have pre-function that wraps two sides. You'll have the uh, alley and, um, and then also on to uh, Newberry. Everything in the back will be breakout. It'll be just you know boring stuff, breakout rooms and bathrooms and mechanical rooms and offices and all that sort of stuff. But we are keeping it at two stories. At one time, uh, talking to McDonald, he, he thought maybe we needed three floors, but we really don't. This gives you all the space you'll need to grow into for many, many years. And I'll tell you, I love, I love, love, love the idea of repurposing this building and giving it life for another hundred years. Which is great. See one more thing, just so everybody here and you enjoy this iterative process where we see something and then go, ah, oh, maybe not. Um, but as you are here, you have suggested there to the right uh, a small retail space um, uh, at the end of the existing alley building where Taco Sushi is, uh, perhaps uh, a greenhouse or, or oh, something yeah. along those lines, um, which is a wonderful idea, but we're not sure we like it. Um, so. Uh, that's our comment um, that may not uh, may not fly. Oh, that's, so, that's a good segue because okay. we're here to get your ideas and that's the kind of input that we want is let's let's not do that. So my presentation and uh, look forward to everybody's comment. Yes, yeah, so Mayor, we can skip the next slide. It's more inspiration photos and go straight to Jennifer because I know we want to get to everybody. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jennifer Beal with Beal Engineering. Uh, we have, we're the city's uh, on-call traffic engineer. And so we've been looking at the traffic flow, the impacts of traffic flow, and then a, a initial 
you know, as I said, the, the, the plan is changing, but, you know, what the parking demand is, what our supply is. And so I thought I would just walk briefly through kind of where we stand from parking and traffic on kind of these three blocks, uh, Newberry, uh, Lawrence, and Chesterfield, uh, between Richland and Park Avenue, and then uh, get into kind of what the projected uh, parking and traffic flow would be. So if go to the next slide. Um, you can kind of jump through that. You can just advance, uh, start here. So every, kind of everybody knows where it is. We're here. Um, project is kind of where that uh, star is. Go to the next slide. So if we start to talk about traffic flows, so as traffic engineers, we look primarily at, at morning and evening, but we wanted to kind of get a perspective of Chesterfield, Newberry, and Lawrence from a daily standpoint. And these are the northbound and southbound traffic flows. So working kind of left to right from Lawrence to Chesterfield, um, well, Lawrence and Chesterfield have about somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 vehicles per day um, per direction. And we get to Newberry, Newberry has more of about six to 700, 800 uh, vehicles. And that's, that's in each direction. So the up arrows are northbound, the down arrows are southbound. If we go to the next slide, so then we start to look at what are our morning volumes and our afternoon volumes. And so similarly, Chester, you'll see Chesterfield and, and Lawrence are, are different but have generally similar volumes. Um, we've got about direction, directionally anywhere from about 200 to 300 vehicles uh, northbound and then also southbound on Lawrence and Newberry, or sorry, Lawrence and Chesterfield. And then we have in the morning about 30 or so vehicles northbound and 30 or so vehicles southbound. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, nope, back, sorry, back, yep. Um, here we have the afternoon volumes. You see they're, they're slightly higher on, on Newberry. We're 56 more, these, and this is on an average day. So this is just an average weekday that occurs um, uh, usually during you know, spring, not, not a summer day, not a weekend day. These are just kind of what we see on an average weekday, and that's what we study uh, traffic analysis for. Um, here we have, you know, about 300 to 400 vehicles northbound and or southbound on Chesterfield and Lawrence. So that just kind of gives you a perspective of these three blocks and, and the, the traffic flows that we're seeing today. And these are, these are this spring, these are counts taken this spring. And then the next slide kind of shows this uh, throughout the day. So we'll, we'll uh, go into these, but this is a 15 minute period what the volumes are on each road. So if we go to the next slide, this is what we have on Newberry Street. And I think everybody knows when we, that, that comes to downtown a lot, you know, Newberry Street has a little bit lower volumes. It's actually pretty balanced. So the lower the volume where it's really flat at the beginning of the slide um, at zero, that's your midnight time. That's where there's not a lot of activity on Newberry around, you know, 7.30, 8 a.m. It starts to increase. It stays pretty steady throughout the day with a little increase for the lunchtime time period. And then after about 7.30, as you can kind of see, it comes right back down um, to having uh, not as much traffic flow. If we go to the next slide, this is the um, Lawrence Street, and you can see we've got much stronger peaks. So what this kind of shows is, you know, from really 12 midnight to 6 a.m. There's not a lot of activity in downtown on the, on the roads, as you would expect, because most people are asleep. Um, but this one, you start to see it really at 6, 6.30 time period, we start to increase. And we start to get more traffic flow downtown with, you know, your peaks occurring there midday and then the afternoon, and then it starts to um, drop off. And so this is where these volumes are 15 minute periods, what was occurring every 15 minutes, and that's what the dots are on this, on this graph. If we go to the next one, Chesterfield, you can see it's slightly different than the Newberry, or the, the Lawrence graph. We have a little bit stronger morning peak. Um, and when you have the, the, the axis over on the left that goes from zero to 120, that is that traffic volume that you see. So for example, um, Chesterfield northbound, we've got about 80 vehicles um, at that peak at about 730. Um, so basically, this just gives a kind of background of the flow that we see throughout the day, as well as what the, the level of volume is. If we go to the next slide. 
So we've done uh, parking studies in the downtown kind of sub area there outlined in red over to the right uh, in 2015, 17, and, and 21. And this essentially looks at this kind of downtown parking um, sub area. It's about 596, about 600 parking spaces that we look at. Um, and we do a average weekday, but we always, we always try to have some sort of event, do it on a day where there's an event. There's Amphi Alley, there were the farmer's market was here in 2015, to kind of get an idea of what these flows are and how these blocks um, are occupied and how long people are staying in the blocks and so on and so forth. So we've got a couple years of, of data as we work through that. What we found is that the, in the 2021 study that the peak occurred at 7 p.m. during an Amphi Alley event. And we were about, of those 596 spaces within this red area, um, it was about 81% occupied. So while there were some blocks that were full, um, for example, for the Amphi Alley, you had the Newberry block was pretty full. It wasn't very, it wasn't, it was full kind of during lunchtime and during the day, and we'll get, I've got more detail on that. And Lawrence, but you know, Lawrence closer to Barnwall wasn't as busy as the section between Richland and Park Avenue. Um, the other peaks that occurred, just to to note, um, were around lunchtime, the 1 p.m. hour, the 12, the noon hour, and then 6 p.m. were all about 70 percent, 70 to 80 percent occupied. So those are really the four maximum time periods, and we started seven. So we did start at 7 a.m. and went through. Uh, 7 p.m., which ends at, at 8 o'clock. So um, we have a good kind of perspective of what the tra the parking flow in the downtown area is um, historically over the years, but most recently in 2021. Go to the next slide. This com provides a comparison of what the total occupied spaces were every every hour from 7 to 7 in 2015. We actually started at 9 a.m., not 7, so that's why the, the first two, uh, that 7 and 8 a.m., only have two columns there. But the black color is the 2015 information, uh, the light blue is 2017, and the purple is 2021. And so what you can see here is that even with an event situation, when you look at those six blocks of uh, parking spaces, those 600 spaces, we're under an 85% occupancy and, and well under a 100% occupancy. Um, we use 85%, 85% in when you look at parking from a parking garage standpoint is that's when you start to kind of search for spaces. When you're in a parking lot, you can actually, you know, you don't start to search for spaces until that percentage is a little bit higher, but in a garage, that's when you're kind of like, you know, having to having to look, there's not you can't just like pull in and, and find a space and you, you might have to go up a level. And so we look at both that 85% and then 100% occupancy when you're looking at parking. Um, next slide. This one looks particularly at the Newberry Street uh, block itself, and you can kind of see throughout the day, uh, you know, you're 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 well under that 85% as we got to more of Amphi Alley or that real high one and. 2015, that was when the farmer's market was a little bit earlier. Um, you know, you can start to get this Newberry block got quite full um, when you, there's a special event in the alley. So this kind of gives you a perspective of what it, what it was now with the, the city building moving to uh, Richland and Chesterfield. This looked a lot different this morning. Um, the, there, was a, there are a lot fewer um, parking, folks parking on Newberry in the morning, in the morning hours. So it does vary based on when businesses move or when things are open and closed and all that. But this this gives you a perspective over three years, um, three years of data what this new grade block has done um, in 15, 17, and 21. Uh, next slide. So specifically looking at the Newberry conversion, what this would do if it was, if Newberry Street was northbound only, you would be traveling down Lawrence to Park Avenue to then come up Newberry if you wanted to go to something that was on Newberry Street, or you would come down Chesterfield. So basically the two higher level facilities, Lawrence and Chesterfield, you would use more and then get to, if you were going to go to Newberry Street, you would come then up 
Newberry Street uh, northbound. And so this kind of just gives a little bit of what that, how that traffic flow might change. And as we said, the, the southbound Newberry traffic volumes are not particularly high when you compare them to um, the other roads in the vicinity. Uh, next slide. So, so I said we kind of looked at 600 spaces for that really detailed parking study over the years. Um, but we looked at something that we call a five minute walk. And a five minute walk is typically, in parking terms, what people are comfortable parking and you know, walking five minutes to wherever their destination is, or five minutes or less. So as you can kind of see, the yellow blocks are approximately within that five minute walk of the corner of Richland and Newberry Street, you know, where the, the, where the um, Parks and Pascal's Pascal is, is planned. Um, you can see it's that blue dot. And when you look at all the parking within that five minute walk, you're at about 1,100 spaces. Um, if you do a 10 minute walk, and so in the bigger cities, that, that um, diameter of what you're willing to walk for, you know, when you get into a, a really dense city, you look at something more like a 10 or 15 minute walk where you have like a parking space, but I'm willing to walk, you know, six, seven, eight blocks because that's where the parking is located. Um, so if you go within that 10 minute area, you're more at like 1,500 spaces. Um, as, and that's kind of those red, and it, it extends beyond that, but realistically, um, knowing the area, you know, I don't think that, you know, people would start to just drive to the closer area rather than walking, you know, six or eight blocks here. Um, when we get to theirs, there's also a couple off, I'd be remiss in not mentioning, there's the about 76 spaces that are off-site. Those are the, the lots that are located in green. It's the lot behind um, the new city building, the regions area, and then also that small lot up on uh, Richland um, up, across from uh, B lane essentially. So that's kind of what we look at. That's what we have from an existing parking uh, availability. And then we go to the next slide. So if we look at, you know, approximately five years from now, um, we have taken into account the uh, planned garage, which is now, which is uh, at 381 spaces. That's the filled in blue circle. We've got the light blue circle where, with the conversion, you would reduce some spaces on, on Newberry Street and you would net approximately 60 parking spaces. And so that, that would change. And then also there are uh, potential plans to increase the northern Newberry blocks in Newberry between uh, Barnwell and Richland and get approximately 40 additional spaces there. And then um, there's potential for a new Aiken uh, Corporation offsite lot on Newberry that would have another 75 spaces. So your your on site your on street supply would go down slightly, um, but your off street supply would increase. And so we look at that as kind of like what our just got an uh, idea of what this would look like um, potentially in five years. If we go to the next slide. So that's that's kind of supply. So now we want to go to demand. So that's kind of what we have, and then what do we expect is needed. So if you go to the next slide. We have, uh, so we used uh, shared parking. So shared parking is, um, it provides single use codes for what the parking should be expected based on um, national research, and then also how those, how uses work together. So where you build a parking space and the parking space is used by multiple users based on their time of day. And so there are charts and curves and, and you know, this use needs this many spaces at 6 a.m. and it needs this other use needs this many spaces at 6 a.m. and it marries all those together to look and see what the potential um, parking demand would be for, for, for a project or an area. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this is the program that we, we ran, and this would be ever evolving, you know, based on whatever the, the project, um, you know, these, these go up and down as the project is refined. But the program here is, is uh, 117 apartments, 100 hotel rooms, 25,000 events, square feet of event center. We've got the 250 seat live theater uh, for the playhouse, and then 5,000 of retail and 5,000 of dining, and you know these may change slightly, but we have a we have the, the the furthest column is if these things were all by themselves, what would their demand be? 
and it's about 600. When you start to look at efficiencies of spaces, it um, you're able to get to about 369. And so that's where people aren't necessarily in the spaces at all times. You know, you're going to have an office, so stereotypically an office user is 8 to 5. Well, then that space is available in the evening. So, for example, retail can pick up that evening availability of space. And so it all works together and gets kind of, as I said, kind of married on top of each other to see how the most efficient use of those spaces is. Um, if you go to the next slide, what we found is that, um, so this looks at it hourly, monthly, and everything. The peak parking with the current plan with that program is actually 8 p.m. on a weekend in March. So it runs through every month, it runs through every, every hour, and so when we look at that, that's where that 369 spaces comes from. And we did reserve in the analysis uh, 141 spaces for the apartments. And so what we see is about a 40% um, shared parking, um, uh, of, of where the shared parking can be shared. You go to the next slide. So as I said, this will change um, generally as, as that demand number may change. Um, but we've got the 369, so this basically takes our supply and demand from a total supply where every single space is used to that 85th percentile supply um, that we talked about is when people have to start looking, I mean, spaces are there, but you have to start looking, looking for the spaces. Um, and as you can see, we'll talk at the bottom, but I mean, that 15% is actually a significant number of spaces available. But we've got the parking garage at 381, um, and we've got the, the demands we talked about. So we've got the demand of the project as well, of Project Pascalis, as well as the demand that will be created when Newberry is changed, because we do need to find a spot for those Newberry folks um, as, as uh, the space count changes on Newberry. A bunch of calculations and, and everything, and you end up, I will say one thing, we did talk about the new municipal building lot is available in the evenings and so those two the 51 and the 43 with the star are available in the evening and that's why at the bottom we've got kind of a day number and a night number um, but we've got the 100 percent we've got about 780 spaces available day based on the assumptions of that plus five years if you did that 85 percent would be 544 um, and we've got a demand with the current program at about um, with the conversion um, at about 486 and so in the evening we have a little bit we have some more spaces available because of the municipal lot so I know that was very fast and a lot of numbers but um, I believe this will be available yes. to to digest <laughs> and I'm sure you may have questions okay and then uh, we're running a little bit long so do it fast got it <laughs> Being here, I'm Lance Sheely. I'm the landscape architecture design, design group manager with Cranston. With me here today is Dennis Welch, our principal in charge. Um, I had the great pleasure in the, early in my career to work on the alley as a landscape architect. A lot of the characters that you that you have so much come to know and love, and had already had that was incorporated into the alley. I had a, a part in that. Um, just to you know, we have had lots of opportunities to work with City of Bacon, and we're glad to be here with the opportunity. Um, next slide. Okay, um, for a brief overview, I just want to take you guys through um, the plan view at first, and then we have a lot of picture slides and that I think will get the idea across. Um, so starting from the east side, the overview for this project, the eastern sidewalk along the east side of Newberry where the community theater is will remain mostly unchanged. We'll have the same dimension from the back of the sidewalk to the front of the curb and the angular parking will stay. Um, additionally, staying on this side of Newberry will be the drop-off area for the um, community theater and the only real change along the street face is that there's a potential connection to Chesterfield. Um, 
It's talking about the roadway, we'll maintain the angular parking that we just talked about. We'll have a 20 foot roadway width that will allow for um, fire access and give us a little bit of extra room um, for those larger equestrian type vehicles that may be parking along the streets here. So we'll have a nice wide street that accommodates everybody as well as fire traffic. And then the area where we really want to focus our time today um, is on this westbound side. Uh, starting at Park, we have a passive green space here that you can see that would be a place that would kind of be our secondary lawn. Um, this would be about a 50 by 100 area. We'll have trees on both sides. We're looking at, um, along this whole corridor on the west side, having basically two sidewalks, a sidewalk at the street and a sidewalk at the building face, both about 16 feet wide, so they're nice wide sidewalks that congregate on them to move north and south. And then we have these little spaces in between that are where we're going to stop and gather. To, to get out of that, we're walking, going to something, to meet a friend, to have a, a, a drink, to, um, to throw a blanket out and have a picnic. Um, so this area is kind of our passive area where it would be a secondary lawn. We'd have some outdoor dining for these buildings here along uh, Business Divino. Uh, we'll have a plaza at the convention center um, that can be used for outdoor dining and seating. It's kind of an, uh, an entry point for uh, the convention center. Then we'll cross the alley. We'll bring the alley paving, a lot of that characteristic, out from the existing alley all the way to the new alignment of Newberry Street. Then we'll have a central area that we're calling our central green, and that will be where we would have most of our events, anything that we would have a stage for, anything that um, is kind of a community gathering. And we chose that location because it's convenient from the multifamily building, from the new municipal building, from the existing uh, places we have on the alley, and also from the new convention center. Moving north, sorry, I'm losing my pointer there. Do you guys see it at all? Okay. Uh, B Lane extension will kind of mimic some of those same paving patterns from the alley to, uh, as we talked about, to en engage this uh, street, this uh, extension. We will um, bring some extra paving in there. And then on this block right in front of the multifamily, um, we mentioned that we have about a 60 foot corridor there. So we'll have again those sidewalks in the front and the, uh, next to the building, the sidewalk next to the street. And then that row of trees is approximately the size of the existing alley to give you a, a, a feel for how that might feel. And in that area we'll have some raised walls, some places to sit, nice place for somebody from the uh, apartment building to come out and gather with friends or to, to walk a dog. Um, and just a great place to kind of chill off the life and, and take a break from the day of shopping or, or have a bicycle. Um, I'll take you through the slides now as far as the, the still shots we have that will really paint the picture a little better for you. So if we can go, we'll start right here where this arrow is, and we'll be looking in the direction, uh, in the northern direction. Hey Lance, real quick, I mean, I think you used the word convention center, and it's really not a convention center. It's more of an event space. Convention center is much larger. Apologize for that. Um, again, this is, I'm sorry this slide's coming through a little dark, but you can see this will be the green space area. We could serve as food trucks off of our wide sidewalk, so this is going to be a nice convenient area for people to gather at any time of year, any time of day. Uh, this building here on the left hand side is kind of the convention center. You'll have to use your imagination a bit and plug in what Stephen has so um, nicely illustrated for us, but that would be the area for the convention center there. Sorry. <laughs> right. All right, so we'll move here to this area. Uh, this is part looking north towards the conference center. And uh, you can see the same food trucks we had there, a nice view of what uh, Newberry Street might look like with our angular parking on one side. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're gonna look from Newberry down the alley. And so this is what we'll have here. Conference center on your left with the outdoor plaza. The community green space on the right, this is that end building of the alley Next slide, please. We go back and look at the uh, conference, the uh, cafe area out front of the conference center. That's what that might look like—a nice place to dine, perhaps a central fountain, some walls that would be low, residential style walls that you see throughout the neighborhoods in Aiken, as well as some, some maybe some detail from the walls that we've seen at Copeland Gardens and places like that. Um, now this will be looking from the convention center, second story. 
back out onto that same plaza. Again, it gives you a nice view for how that streetscape coordinates with the, the cafe seating and the tennis club across the street. It's a nice scale of that street. Nice soft. Again, looking from the convention center back onto the passive green space. This is looking south of the park. This will be looking from Newberry into the, into the uh, stage area, the common green space. So that's how you see how we would lay there. And that's, uh, that's approximately enough room for um, about 100 blanket type concert seating for about 400 people at a standing room only festival event. Next slide, please. This one is looking from the alley back across that same space. So you see the gate, look for the alley there, and looking back at the um, community theater, the alley will extend all the way to the new alignment of Newberry, and that green space will kind of function as that central area. Looking now from the top, back south from the corner of Richland and Newberry. We'll see the area, this larger building here is approximately where the uh, multifamily building would be. Uh, obviously much more uh, articulated than this, um, but that is a good example of the scale that we talked about, how from the street it doesn't feel so imposing because it's sitting far enough back and it has some relief in the trees. Lance, uh, please note specifically, because sometimes it's hard for people to understand, um, that's the shape and size of the building. It has no windows. It has no doors because um, you're working on separate designs. And these guys, the, this will be incorporated into your presentation when they do have a, a finished elevation. That is correct. That is correct. So use your imagination here a little bit. Plug in what we showed, what we saw earlier with the uh, multifamily building, and there you have it. These are the low walls again that we talked about from, you know taking interest from Oakland Gardens, from some of the residential tail scale, low story walls that we would have. And you would flow north-south on the back sidewalk there if you're shopping, if you're coming from Newberry, maybe parking, flow north-south on this side. And this space in between becomes a nice place to hang out, uh, eat a lunch, uh, take a break from shopping, things like that. Final slide we have, looking from the opposite side. And lean, lean a, little bit, a little bit closer into the mic. The, Final slide we have here is standing at the corner of Richland, looking south uh, at the Aiken Community Theater here. Again, just a second shot through that um, green space that we have on the north side of that building. So that's our final slide, but we do have an animation that we hope will make that um, this come a little clearer, more of an experiential view of what you might see as we're going down this future potential corridor. All right, I agree. I think we get the idea. I appreciate it. We can just leave that running while folks comment. All right, so again, we've, we've come to the point. Um, we're going to have, there will be timing for us, um, three minutes. Uh, remember, uh, make your comments. No rebuttals. It's safe. Say whatever you want to say. Um, and whatever questions you have, state those and uh, return to your seat. And we will then answer them. As a matter of fact, we're going to need the, the first few people who ask questions to, to shuffle back and forth because we want to get some of the people into the overflow to be able into here. Yes, sir. Hey. 
My name is John David from 107 Perry Winkler Court in Aiken. Can you turn that microphone back towards you? There you go. Can you hear me better now? Yes. 107 Perry Winkler Court. And uh, I was expecting a little bit different uh, meeting today. And I had some, uh, what I hope would be uh, suggestions for uh, finding common ground between preservationists and uh, council in the various commissions. Uh, but it seems like I'm getting a little bit different feeling. I uh, do want to commend everybody that presented because I think you did uh, what you were asked to do and you did a very good job at it. Thank you. Uh, but I don't. But I only have one question, and uh, Mr. Uh, O'Brien, I'm a little confused at your opening comments whether you can answer a question or not answer a question, but I only have one, and then I'll sit down. Uh, this gives me the feeling that any discussion or debate concerning Newberry Street, the 117 apartments, or the demolition of the hotel, uh, there will be no further debate on that. I don't see council members. I don't, and they may be some may be in here. I don't know. So, so, and that's a sincere question. I'm not trying to be smart. If if we're beyond that, there's not going to be any debate. I think several of us don't even need to be here. But uh, with all due respect, if you can answer that, fine. If not, that's okay too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, I can answer that, and Mary Tilton can help me answer it as well. She's our uh, design review board uh, planner. Um, you saw on the fly a, a new uh, drawing that Stephen put up that I said, I, I love it, except for that part. Um, a couple of weeks ago, McDonald Law said, we really want to do something nice with the municipal building that you're moving out of. What about this idea? And this man groaned for two days about, I don't want to have to do that. Uh, but now he loves it. So from that perspective, the DRB, uh, which every, they've been having special work sessions. Um, so this group, which are open to the public, uh, for everybody to come in and participate in all of those discussions, for everything from historic preservation uh, to the look and feel, the windows, um, the trim, the color of the brick. Um, and this is not a done deal. Um, there are things that I guarantee you are going to change about each and every thing of this. Um, the city council, uh, who will be filtering in the different meetings, and I expect more of them will be here at our 7 o'clock session, um, will have to consider at some point, uh, they've passed first reading of uh, including a portion of Newberry Street in those improvements uh, to create the uh, new promenade. Uh, but there's going to be a public hearing uh, related to that. Um, and the DRB, um, let's discuss a little bit about what their process will be moving forward. And, and again, uh, just one more plug for um, the website for the Municipal Development Commission. It's Aiken MDC, the letter M D C dot org. Um, and you will not find, I can guarantee you, in the state of South Carolina, um, people talk about transparency. Every check that's ever been written by the AMDC, there's an image of it on that site. Every document. Um, our RFP process and how we selected the partners that we've been working with, all of those documents, the closing documents for every piece of property we've bought, every iteration of these designs are posted. Um, and you certainly can communicate with me, members of the DRB and the City Council, um, because it really will make this project better to have everybody involved and as many people as we can um, pleased uh, with what's moving forward. So to that, uh, who's next? Uh, I see a plaid hand in the back. I can't see the face. Yes, sir.
Good afternoon. My name's Harold Milton, and uh, this time of the year at least, I reside at 153 Florence Street. And uh, I have a question, but I guess I've got to frame my question with a presumption. Uh, I guess I'm surprised to hear this morning that we're not getting a convention center because at least my impression to this point has been in what I read and what I hear discussion on the street that the need for the additional parking, the additional retail, the additional hotel rooms has been driven at least to some significant extent by the expectation that Aiken either is or will soon become a convention destination. And I, for one, don't share in that expectation. And uh, if that expectation indeed plays any part of the justification, I need to be convinced and my question with that introduction is, can any one of you convince me that Aiken is or will soon become a convention destination? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I cannot convince you that Aiken will become a con uh, convention destination because it will not. You're absolutely right. Um, there has never been a plan to build a convention center. Um, convention centers are several hundred thousand square feet, and they have... Uh, huge groups of people that go and they have uh, hundreds and hundreds of hotel rooms associated. Um, they have, uh, you know, exhibit halls where people pull in 18 wheelers and do all kinds of things. That's never been the vision uh, for Aiken. Aiken is a desirable location for small market meetings, which uh, Stuart Biedenboe uses the example of the Bluebird Society, um, which is actually a group that came in and met at our conference center downstairs. Um, the current uh, facility that we have in Newberry Hall, uh, you're all familiar with it. It remains very active with civic clubs, weddings, and different events. We're talking about a few degrees of increase to meet a need that we do have, and we have had extensive uh, feasibility studies, demand studies uh, related to, and we also know anecdotally that the Savannah River site has lots of uh, small to medium-sized meetings that they would like to have lodging and accommodations and food and meeting space, um, which we have a convocation center. doesn't have a hotel. Um, there's no ready food service there. And it's a gymnasium. Um, so we want something that would be nice and comfortable, and we know there is demand, and we've done a lot of interviews in our study process with the professionals we hired, who do this all over the country, by the way, um, that they believe that we would be successful in drawing regularly uh, statewide associations and different groups. Uh, I've been a member of several who wish they could come to Aiken, but they could only go to Columbia, they could go to Greenville, um, to smaller facilities, not their big convention centers. Um, but this will put us in play there, and these people will come to Aiken. I can guarantee you that. Next. Right over here. This man. Hi, my name is Amy Tinney, and um, we're building, so we're in a hotel, don't have a permit yet. But thank you for your. Not the Hotel Aiken, right? Yeah, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but nice job on the presentation, it's just way too long. So I hope they cut it down for tonight's people, because that was just. I think a lot of us are here because we don't want this, and we already know we're in the door. We're just tuning to, to this out. So, um, I'm moving here because it was small, quaint, and traditional, and family is coming and following us from Houston, and it is um, unfathomable that once you open that door, precedent gets set, and things come and get bigger and bigger, and we don't want to see that. That's all just opinion here. Don't want downtown apartments. Don't want downtown parking garage. And thank you. Um, Your thoughts. 
I like coming down here. I want to see it stay, stay small, quaint, and low. None of this five, six-story stuff down here. And I, I don't know what, are my taxes going up for any of this? Who's paying for this? How much am I going to be paying for this when I don't want it? I'm looking at, a, you're telling us about a 300-person banquet room. How often is that going to be used? For what? For how many days, how many user days a year are we going to use that? Who's paying the insurance? Who's paying for the cleaning? Who's paying for the electric? On and on and on for all this stuff. So I guess that's my remaining question is what is it going to cost me? Because um, I don't see any value in it already and I don't want one cent of my taxes going up for this. I have no idea where the money's coming from and anybody I talk to doesn't either. The rumor on Facebook is that somebody in the city paid way too much for land that doesn't have the value that we paid. You can clear that up for us, but that's all I'm going to say because other people want to chime in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in answer to the question about the uh, conference center design, again, I would uh, uh, point you to the uh, AMDC website where the extensive study on the demand and, and what would come in is uh, available. Um, and so if you could just look at that, I think it would be educational for you. Yes, sir, the gentleman in the, the blazer here on the center row. Yes. Hello, how are you, Thurman? Hello, I am Thurman uh, Botley, uh, 3138 White Gate Loop. Uh, I'm uh, representing the Aiken Community Theater, and I need to state up front, the board has taken no position on this project one way or the other. But we do have questions and I'd like to just leave them with you for maybe later answers. Uh, first of all, as one of the businesses that will still remain on Newberry Street as the construction of the project begins, if it goes forward, um, our business is likely to be highly disrupted during the time of the construction period, whatever that is, one, two, or three years. Uh, and we're really going to have to uh, seek some assistance and want to know what might be available in the future to compensate for business losses at that point. Uh, secondly, have the Newberry, Park, uh, Newberry Parking Street spaces been expanded? I think I heard a reference to them being more than the 35 we heard at the last meeting. Uh, so if they've been expanded, I'd just like to know that number. And uh, while the traffic pattern presentation was interesting, I want to make sure, did that happen over weekends too, or was it just the five-day work week? If it did not include a weekend, that is a very busy time for Newberry Street on um, performance nights for the several groups that use this theater. So uh, greatly reducing the parking on Newberry or its uh, vicinity plus uh, hopefully growing audiences as the bug dies off, um, I think we might have a problem there. So uh, if we'd like answers to those questions, uh, I'll perform you want to give them to us, but in writing would be preferred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to, to touch a couple of those, um, we have our uh, construction experts. As far as the, the parking, Jennifer can speak to that, but that, that was kind of an hour-by-hour hour study. Hour by hour study it was a weekday, but it was an event day. I don't know if there was any event at at, at the theater, but um, it did. There was an Amped Alley event, um, and the traffic flows were uh, were average weekday. Okay. And then uh, Brandon, I know it's early yet, but if you could address kind of uh, traffic controls uh, and parking during construction generally. Yeah, sure. In, in any project, um, uh, smaller project or project of this magnitude, there's going to be areas specified for laydown areas, traffic control measures, etc. This uh, presents a bit of a little bit of a unique challenge in a downtown urban environment. Um, the team you see before you has all worked in those environments. Um, we're not going to pretend that uh, there would be no disruption. There would obviously be disruption, um, but it would be our job to work with each and every. Um, tenant, vendor, occupier to minimize that. Um, there would be several plan sheets uh, in, in a civil plan set just on that alone. Um, Commissioner Chris Marines. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Marines. I'm 246. I live 246 Barnard, the city limits of Aiken, lifelong resident in the city limits of Aiken. 
I appreciate the opportunity you've afforded us to uh, provide input into the process. I do value the discussion here today and the various viewpoints. This is a very healthy tension for our community and it's reflective of the spirit that makes Aiken uh, such a special place. I support what you have proposed and my views are informed by the fact that I have been a lifelong resident of Aiken. My parents and grandparents immigrated uh, from Greece to Aiken and ran businesses in downtown Aiken. And growing up in Aiken, I've been witness to a community that has successfully balanced a reverence for the past with an eye towards the future. So I also have a healthy respect and sensitivity to our history and our values, but also to our, to our future. My view on the growth and development of Aiken is similar to what I hear many people talk, the way they talk about the Constitution. Our local forefathers did a really good job in Aiken and how it was established. They were visionaries, they set the tone. It may not have been perfect, actually it was imperfect. Aiken has been a living document with measured changes and improvements along the way in varying moments of time. Like the founding fathers, our local founders could not anticipate 100 to 200 years into the future. But they would count on us to make amendments along the way while respecting the traditions of the past so that we as the current stewards of our community establish additional traditions that will stand the test of time similar to the ones that we inherited. The change you are considering, I believe, is respectable of our past with a nod to the future in three ways. First, it is a blend of the old, the repurposing and preservation of this municipal building built in 1938 as part of the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works. Second, it is a blend of the new, a new hotel that respects and is consistent with our community's historic buildings and architecture. And third, it honors and builds on one of our most valued and prized assets, our beautiful parkways. The Newberry Street changes build on those values of blending green space or nature in the heart of our beautiful bustling downtown, a contrast that creates a unique sense of place for our community. I also along the way have disagreed with parts of what we were doing, but I think the, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts in moving our community forward. Finally, there's an old saying that we don't inherit the land from our parents, we borrow it from our children. By bridging the old with the new, we will be giving our children a product that honors and respects our past while positioning our community for generations seconds. in a way that continues to attract people uh, from all walks of life as we strive to form our more perfect community. We all recognize this is a pivotal time in our community's history. I believe that these changes will meet the moment. Thank you, Zoe. Hey guys, there. Yes, ma'am. My family has been here for over 250 years. I have watched Aiken grow and grow and grow. You say parking spaces. Y'all all say you come to Aiken because you love it here. Why do you want to change it? It's perfect like it is. Progress is good, but not all progress is good. When it starts to if, if when it starts to interfere with people's lives, it's not good. We like our downtown just like it is. When my friends come into town, we don't go to Augusta, we don't go to Columbia, we come to downtown Aiken. Yes, I might have to walk two blocks for a parking space on occasion, but I don't mind. It's worth it. Actually, you're not going to make a profit on it. It's a losing situation that way. This dog won't hunt aesthetically. It is ugly. It is five stories. I've seen what y'all have done in Asheville. My father's people are from there. I saw what happened to downtown Asheville. I've seen what's happened to Bluffton. I do not want that to happen here. I came to Aiken for its charm. I moved back home. I've been all over the southeast. I said, when I move back home to South Carolina, my people are from around here. I'm going home. I came here because of the charm. I do not want it destroyed. The dog won't hunt. Thank you. Thank you. Right over here, Charlie. 
Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can, can we ask speakers to lean into the microphone where Zoom participants are having a hard time? Yes. Thank you, Charlie Hartz, 271 Highland Reserve Court. Um, I hold three business licenses in Aiken, uh, none of which are downtown, so I don't have a, fi a financial dog in this hunt. Um, but as someone who cares deeply about our town, however, I am strongly in favor of the project that will improve the vibrance and vitality of our downtown. Aiken has a long history of commissioning studies and then having them put on a shelf to gather dust and never be seen again. Let's not take another five years to study whether the hotel can be saved while it continues to deteriorate. Change is never easy, but it is inevitable. Look at what happened to the alley when we stopped traffic and allowed drinks to be taken out of restaurants. It's now a great addition to our town. Remember, if we are not moving forward, we are going backwards. We all want our kids and our grandkids to stay in Aiken. And for that to happen, we have to have a vibrant, active downtown. Uh, I like the plan. Let's keep on looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there somebody against the back wall? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Clark Woolley, 827 Carlton Avenue Southeast. I just have a very short observation from my point of view. Uh, as I see this as an urban type of development, of a small town. This project would forever change the character of the town of Aiken. Such a dramatic and permanent change should not be under the control of those who may be seen by some people as bureaucrats and power brokers. It should proceed only with the consent of the citizens of this town by a formal vote. <laughs> One thing is for sure, if this project proceeds, Egan will never again be awarded the honor of being the best small town in the South. Thank you. Young lady in black at the back wall. Emily Murphy, 149 Edwater Drive. I think this is fantastic. As a mother of three small children, I find it very exciting to have somewhere to come all week long to come bring my children downtown to play. The only thing I will add, it's very hot here in the summer. Can we add a sprinkling water system for kids to play in? That's my only thought. So thank you all very much for your presentations. It was great. Thank you. Right here in the second row. My name is Cindy Russo, 145 Red Cedar Road, Aiken, and I also own a business downtown, Cindy Sweet Shop. Thank you all for presenting to us. I think it was wonderful. I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm not originally from here. I'm from Syracuse, New York. One thing I absolutely love is our youth. Our youth is going to be my next, and I want Aiken to represent that. We need something for our youth. This is different. It's exciting. I want small business. Small business is very important to our downtown. Like everyone else, downtown attracted me. We need to keep small business here. We need to grow. The Hotel Aiken, as it was, which will no longer be, hasn't added to us. We've lost businesses because of us. Every time that somebody comes into my shop, they're like, where can we stay? There's not a lot. There's nowhere for families to stay in. If we don't go like this, I don't want to see it that we're putting more money into this so it's not profitable. So I can't move my business there if I wanted to. If my family couldn't stay there. I, I hope that we can come to a resolution that this succeeds for everyone. It's a really great idea. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Bush in the back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
My name is Michelle Page Bush, and I live at 811 Valley View Street, Aiken. I am 64 years of age. I was born and raised here in Aiken, South Carolina, just a few blocks that way. When people say they think of it as a small town, it's not as small as what it used to be. It has, since its inception, embraced change since 1834. I taught history, South Carolina history, for 17 years. Everything about Aiken speaks of change. Over the years, as it has become a retirement mecca, there are people who were original Akenites who balked at the people who came here. They balked at the Yankees and they balked at uh, the snowbirds who have come here and made Aiken his home. But we hear some of those same people who say, we don't want it to change, yet they brought about change. They came because there has been change. Change is a good thing. I've seen change throughout Aiken where streets have been cut off. It happens and we learn to go the other direction. I've seen where buildings have been torn down and rebuilt right here in downtown Aiken and we accepted the change. Someone said, well, we don't want to see apartments downtown, but there are several apartment style living that has been built downtown over the past 15 years that perhaps when you, you weren't here, you didn't know that. So these things have been happening all along. Change is good, and I thank you for what you're bringing to Aiken, and I'm one who embraces it. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, Mary Catherine, do we, do we have anything from, uh, from Zoom? We have a statement from the AMDC chairman. Would you like to hear that at this time? This is AMDC? Okay, yeah, the, uh, Keith Wood, the AMDC chairman, wasn't able to join us due to a um, medical issue. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and read that. Okay. I'm going to read it briefly to honor the three. And it, I don't know yeah, if it's I can long, get read it, it fast. On. Okay. Thank you, Tim O'Brien, and thanks to the presenters for providing an update on Project Pascalis. Your briefings were very informative. I have lived in Aiken County almost my entire life and have been a city resident for 24 years. This community and the city of Aiken are very dear to me, and I treasure its history. But, like many, I have become concerned about our downtown, specifically the lack of growth and the condition of what was once Aiken's most iconic block. There is no doubt this iconic block for our downtown has become an eyesore for us all. Now is the time for leadership to ensure our downtown moves forward and the property in question isn't a public safety hazard for the entire downtown area. As the chairman of the AMDC, I'd like to commend all members of the commission for their hard work and dedication for the mission set in front of us by Aiken City Council, one that is following the guideline of the redevelopment plan one and the adopted economic development plan to ensure all decisions made support the direction provided by City Council. I hope to everyone it is obvious we are trying to move the city forward with downtown development in a way that is transformative and will make many proud for decades to come. I also want to congratulate, congratulate and acknowledge our city leadership. Aiken City Council has taken a bold step to issue the bonds for the purchase of the property. They are also asking many questions as we try to move this project along to ensure this project is successful, but also one that will positively impact the downtown for the next 100 years. Aiken City staff and the AMDC have made much progress, but we have a long way to go, and public input is vital to this process. Everyone wants to get this right for the betterment of our downtown and the entire city. We only have one chance to get this right, and we are doing our best to do so. Before I provide my brief comments to our partners, developers, I would like to quote a good friend of mine and fellow AMDC commissioner. The status quo is not acceptable, in all caps. This is a quote I often refer to as we move through this enormous and challenging process. I also want to remind everyone that the Aiken Design Review Board is heavily involved in the review process. McDonald Law and the entire board are working hard to ensure what is proposed meets the character and flavor of Aiken. I believe their expertise in the process will help ensure that we have exactly what we need for our downtown. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, to our partners, developers. Thanks for the work you have done thus far. The AMDC's due diligence has pro proven thus far to be accurate. I'm going to skip forward. My last comment to you is that I endorse the concepts you have recommended and architectural drawings provided to us thus far. There are some details that I question and perhaps have a slightly different opinion on and I plan to work through the, the comment process in, a, in our negotiations as we further this project along, one which hopefully leads to a successfully executed master development agreement. 
In closing, we have great opportunities for significant progress for our downtown, but we must collectively resolve some of our concerns and overcome the challenges that lie ahead. And that's three minutes. Very good. Very that's good. good job. Right. <laughs> Speed reading. And then so. there, there have been a, there was just one follow up, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Um, And Miss Emma Burt said that there was no response to the previous, this was an earlier speaker's concern about tax fee increases to residents to pay for this development. Uh, at this point, uh, this is a project in design. There, you know, we do have hospitality and accommodations taxes are anticipated, which are penny sales taxes. Uh, that will certainly be the bulk of the funding, but we just don't have the final answer to that question. All right, um, right over here by the column. Hey, I'm Kathy Klein, and I live at 257 Vanderbilt Drive um, in the city of Aiken. And uh, I've lived in Aiken for 22 years, and I love downtown Aiken, and I'm here all the time. Mm -hmm change occurs. But in a former life, I studied under uh, Dr. Barker, okay, Dr. Means. <laughs> I'm a nurse, but I um, was married to an urban planner and architect back in the 70s, who is now an architect in Charlotte, uh, my former husband's there. Um, I've seen changes. I've seen de downtown Greenville when I was afraid to walk the streets at the convention center. <laughs> I've seen changes in Charleston. I've seen changes in Columbia. I've lived here in this tiny little town and I've loved it. I lived a lot of my 25 years in another 25 years in Anderson. And I've seen that small town change and deteriorate. And I just went back there last week, and it's deteriorating, okay? It can happen with change. It can be great and wonderful. It can also cause some very strange things to happen, too. Now, our lovely little town and the whole Aiken County moves at glacier speed. It has for the last 22 years. How long will this project take to complete from today till its completion? Is it all going to happen at the same time? And what about all the small businesses that have actually survived COVID here in our little town? Some of them have thrived, some of them have struggled, and they're my friends. Each and every one of them. They don't own the property that they have their businesses. They rent. There are restaurants that I go to once a week. I could have been told that they were going to close. They don't have a choice. There are shops that are going to be told that they have to close. I think that the people of Aiken have to have a vote so that everybody knows what's going on and has a voice, not just the rich, not just the, the, the shop owners, but everybody needs to have a voice that everyone can hear from. Um, progress comes. I like it, but we also know that I've looked at 25 years of um, urban plans and seen what's shown on the video screen and then what actually happens, okay? It's not the same thing. I love your plans, okay? And if it actually happened, it'd be great. Will it? I don't know. And that's your three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, in, in answer to the question, um, especially uh, the reaction of the business community to COVID-19 pandemic was very important to me because uh, I worked very closely with our small business community uh, and we were able to help each other uh, get through some pretty tough times. Um, this project, it's, this is designed, and I'm the economic development director, this is economic development. This is designed uh, to bring more revenues uh, to the businesses downtown that struggled long before COVID-19 came into being. Um, it, it's been a hard scrabble existence for many of them. They, they get by and they enjoy doing it, 
uh, but most of them aren't getting wealthy. Um, the, the people who will live in these apartments and, and, and go to the uh, event center and uh, visit the restaurants and live in those apartments will be their customers. And that's the engine. Those apartments will make this downtown thrive. It's simple urban planning. Um, so that's what we're looking for. As far as the timeline, um, you know, we, we try to be careful about getting caught on that. We've got to go through a process of getting this approved, so I can't measure it from today. Uh, we don't know how long we're going to have to go through this process, and we'll take as long as it takes to get the right plan for Aiken. Uh, but we believe that we can do some of it in phases, especially if we use the uh, municipal building, because this building, we moved out of it this week into a new building. Um, so we could get started, theoretically, uh, a significant uh, head start on this building and make way for Newberry Hall, etc. cetera. Um, but then the rest of the project, probably four years, um, is a, a liberal estimate, um, hopefully a lot less. Uh, but I wouldn't want to sit here today and be, be quoted in year 3.7. Uh, you said it was going to be done in three years, but... Uh, no more than four, we think. Is that about what you think? Yeah, I would agree with that. It, typically, when we look at these as a, as a general indicator, we say you know, 12 months in a, a planning permit stage and a 24-month build time. Um, and then there is the variable that Tim mentioned here, which is you know, the process that we're going through as we sit here today. Um, that is a you know, vast unknown. Um, the project has uh, other specific, specific variables that we'll deal with. Um, and then, you know, I will pivot back to being able to potentially get started. It's again through this process that we have moved these pieces around um, in, in so many different ways that where we still feel like we've landed on the most beneficial design there is. But it was, you know, being able to piece this to where it could come first. And then we could now both the apartment, multifamily, uh, parking, and the hotel could all go as one at the same time where in previous iterations it may have taken um, you know one one piece to go first to wait on the second piece and it's just a it's an unexpected benefit is the point as far as specifically timing that has that potential and uh, just uh, one other point as far as the businesses go uh, obviously there are incumbent businesses within this footprint um, that I've been working very closely with for months um, each of them have at this point entered a settlement agreement. Uh, those who are on month-to-month -month agreements in, in the, the three shops on Lawrence uh, that I've become great friends with and I'm on a, a, a group text with them and we text all the time. Uh, we're working together on some very exciting plans that we should be able to uh, announce soon if we can get everything locked down. Uh, but I think they're going to do very well and I'm very excited about what we can do to help them. So. Uh, right here in the denim. My name is Sam Cato and I live at 622 Magnolia Street Southeast in the Horse District. Uh, I want to know, I, I must have missed something, but is this a foregone conclusion or is there a possibility of still restoring the old hotel? Um, the other thing I'd like to know is what is the price point of these apartments? And what is the square footage of the apartments? And I agree that it'll never be this sweet, small southern town if you do this. I was here when the old alley existed, and the old alley was charming. And the new alley is pavers, and I hope the people that will rent these apartments will enjoy a lot of noise because I was taken to dinner the other night in the alley for the first time because I don't like the way out the alley looks. I wouldn't go there if I weren't taken. However, the noise from the band outside with all doors closed was so loud, it was hard to have a conversation with my dinner partners. Um, I, I think this is a terrible mistake and one that if you go forward, there's no way to ever look back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in answer to your question about a, a foregone conclusion, 
Um, that, that's a very good question, and it bears repeating some things. These gentlemen here, we hope to work together, but this is a negotiation. Um, they have a contract to purchase the real estate, um, but a lot of things have to happen before we close that contract. Um, in answer to your question, is a foregone conclusion uh, regarding demolition? No, if we can't come to terms and we can't get site approval, um, this deal uh, with these fine gentlemen who have worked very, and ladies who have worked very hard, um, will not close. I'm sorry, you can just speak once. I didn't speak my three minutes, and I have just, <laughs> I'd like, I, so there is a possibility that this won't happen. And we were very clear with the viewers. Okay. Well, Everyone else has observed them. Does please, anybody, please have a seat. Will we have a right to put please it have to a, a seat. vote? Thank you. Um, as far as the foregone conclusion goes, um, if this deal doesn't move through, obviously, uh, the Municipal Development Commission still holds this property and has a desire to redevelop it. Um, we started this process from trying to examine uh, a historic refit of the building, um, and I'm sure that would be in play again. And it's important to note uh, that the DRB's approval for demolition uh, was conditional, and it depends on this deal closing with these gentlemen if it does. So, a DRB approval for a certificate of appropriateness, correct me if I'm wrong, typically is good for two years. Um, but in this case, the condition says, if this doesn't move forward, that uh, is moot. And we would have to start the process all over again. So, uh, against the back wall. Good afternoon. Lisa Smith, I live in the city of Aiken. I have quick questions, if that's allowed. Um, the Terracon environmental study, environmental impact study, uh, is that completed or when will that be completed? Do you know? I'll answer the questions when you're finished with your series. Ask all my questions? Okay. Yes. The environmental study, I'm wondering when that will be completed. I'm wondering, uh, I'm asking questions for a few different people that asked me to ask, so they're all kind of varied, but. Uh, how much will the fees be for the parking garage? How much will the parking garage be to complete? Um, as far as the demo goes, I know you don't know when you'll start, but when you do start, how long will the demo take? And how many dump trucks will be moving debris from out of town, from out of the downtown? Well, I think it's interesting to think about the downtown businesses when you talk about hundreds and hundreds of dump trucks and cement trucks. That's why that question is being asked. Um, and the construction, I guess, 24 months from when you begin to when you finish. What type of, how many cement trucks and large trucks will be bringing things in and out? And how are they going to get up and down our little teeny streets all day long? How many blocks will be closed? As far as the parking goes, on Newberry Street North, will both sides still be available for parking? Or is one in, in the drawings that I saw, it looked like the left side of Newberry Street North will no longer have the parking? And I think that will eliminate 34 more spots. I'm still stuck on the parking lot math. If you build a parking lot with 381 spots, you reserve 140 for the apartments. Um, you close Newberry Street, you lose 77. You close the lane, you lose 30 more. The hotel uses 80. That means we have a net gain of 50, approximately 50 spots from the new parking garage for parking for the city of Aiken. And if you, um, so I'm, uh, really interested in the northbound Newberry parking situation because if you're reducing 35 more spots there, we're down to what? Nine spots? 35? Yeah. 12 spot, 12 spot gain. Um, that, that's a lot of questions. Where should we start? Where can we start? Are those all of them? Yeah. Thank you. Feet and I'll answer the well, questions. I don't want to avoid my time because you won't let me come back. <laughs> well, I'm not answering the questions until you leave. So. So, okay, well, can anyone answer the questions? No, they, I'm the moderator. So Our rules are that you ask your series of questions and then you have a seat. Oh, I didn't see that rule. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're clear on all the questions. The Terracon yeah. study, the net loss of parking, the how long the demo will take, how many trucks we anticipate coming in and out. The construction 24 months for anticipating how many cement mixers and other trucks will be coming in and out of town. How much does the parking garage cost? What are the parking fees? Um, oh, one more. 
How many businesses have currently been evicted? Um, downtown businesses. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And I'm studying and reading the materials that you're putting out, but it still leaves a lot of questions to ask. Okay. I'll start with the. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start with the last one. I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware of any business been evicted in downtown Aiken. None. Not, none have been evicted. Um, this again. This is not a done deal. So why we wouldn't have people move uh, prior to knowing that we're moving forward with the project, and no one will be asked to move until the project moves forward which could be six months, nine months, could be five years, if we're very unfortunate. Um, so, I'm sorry, you asked your question. Um, the Terracon environmental uh, study, I saw that Brandon, you sent through a recent update, and I have no idea what it said, so I'm handing you a loaded gun and shoot at me. Um, where do they stand? Yes, so the process with Terracon that the city or the commission is going through is currently there are four individual voluntary cleanup contracts of which they have uh, been approved on a generic plan to assess and abate. Um, the next step is for those four individual um, uh, VCCs to be approved on the site-specific plans. Um, thereafter, the testing process starts, um, wh whatever that may be, soil, uh, asbestos, et cetera, in anything that is deemed um, that needs to be tested further. Um, so that is where we are in that kind of limbo stage of a general approval to a site-specific approval, um, and then the testing, and then once the test results are back, then they produce a, a cleanup plan based off the specific lab analysis. Um, so as far as a timeline, that could be 60 days, that could be 180 days. We're dealing with um, SED HEC um, and the EPA. So it's a slow moving uh, will. Um, on the parking question, and how much will parking fees be? It's been everywhere in everything that we've done. We don't charge for parking in Aiken. We're not going to start. So it will be zero, with the exception if you'd like to stay at the hotel, uh, Rains will be paying for their parking spaces, poor guys, but uh, the public will park for free in Aiken, South Carolina. Um, and how many trucks there are, I don't want to venture a guess. So, yes, back in the corner. Jim? Jim Tunison, 140 Martin Road. I just want to say as a young professional, this is exactly the type of investment that I want to see in my community. This is something that I've been really excited about. I've been telling my family, my friends, look at what my community is doing. So I'm really excited. I can't wait until it's finished. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> corner, in the back corner, with the lovely mustache. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Lewis. I live at 202 Ascot Drive. That's in the city limits of Aiken. First, let me commend each of you for your presentations today. Uh, it's certainly the most comprehensive one that I have seen or heard to date, and I certainly appreciate all your efforts. I've been a resident of Aiken for nearly 35 years. During this time, I've served as a volunteer on many organizations comprised of numerous individuals who have worked tirelessly to make Aiken, in particular our downtown, a special place. Virtually all of the studies that have been done as part of those efforts have stressed the importance of increasing residential density in our downtown, as it is the heart of our community. As a banker, I believe it is also imperative that retail, dining, and recreational opportunities play a significant role in the economic vitality of the area. The proposed project Pascalis provides for all of that through the addition of a new hotel, apartments, retail space, and a conference center. Just a short time ago, city leadership decided that renovations were needed in the alley 
to transform it into a gathering place for community events with Newberry Street to become a festival center. At some point during this time, it was decided that the alley should be permanently closed to vehicles, making it a pedestrian-only venue, and what a difference it has made in our downtown. I cannot imagine anyone today wanting to change it back to the way it was previously. I have given the proposed plans considerable thought, especially with the potential closing of the southbound lane of Newberry Street and the impact that it may have on the community. I believe this project can be transformational and take our downtown to a whole new level. It can make Newberry Street a phenomenal gathering place for community events and a natural extension of the alley. Further, I believe the conversion of the existing municipal building into a conference center will be a great addition to downtown, while its location adjacent to the alley will create a further positive impact as an economic driver for the area. Another benefit will be that the building which housed the former firehouse in downtown Aiken can be repurposed and saved. Change is never easy. Doing nothing and accepting the status quo is not a viable option. I believe we have a tremendous opportunity right now with Project Pascalis to create a game changer in our downtown with some new development that is iconic and enhances the quality of life for generations to come. Let's work together for a positive outcome that will make all of us proud and truly showcase Aiken as the best small town in the South. Thank you. Sure. Mary Catherine, did you, did you have something? Okay. Uh, Miss Allison, or sorry, Cynthia South stated that Amentum did a study for the city showing tax revenue generated by this project that is many times more than the investment. She says she is sure the city could share this information. And then Karen Poteet, 113 Hartwell Drive, stated that she is in favor of this development plan, particularly. She likes the reuse of the old municipal building because what Aiken does not need is another empty building. Okay, very good. And again, that uh, that study that highlights uh, what the commenter was talking about, about the conservative estimate of $3.3 .3 million in annual local government revenues uh, derived directly from the project is available on the AMDC website, AikenMDC.org. Straight back. Good afternoon. How are you? Yes. My name is Susan French. I live at 1863 Partridge Drive in Aiken, South Carolina. I am a retired 17-year veteran of the city of Aiken. Um, as a historic preservation planner, you've all heard me say everything I'm going to say, but I feel like I need to say it for the record for this meeting. Um, in uh, my time with the city, 17 years from 2000 to 2017, we did so many primary plans, maybe not quite as big as this, but many were almost as big as this. And every single time, and I'm going to say it again because I say it every single time, we always began the process with public input. This is the first time, and I've never imagined it could get this far without us having started in November with public input. Even then, it was, it was a small amount. Okay, so, so let, me, let me keep going on. Okay, my primary concerns are following the zoning ordinance of the city of Aiken, following the guidelines for the old Aiken overlay district and the historic district, the preservation of the parkways, which I know have been taken over for certain instances in the past, which is why the Old Aiken Overlay District was formed to prevent further encroachment in the parkways. It, 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 this can be done without encroaching on Newberry Street. It can be done. There is no reason that we have to use one half of one city block to do absolutely everything. Old Aiken extends from Union Street to Morgan Street. We have an 8.5 acre property that's under con contract for sale with the Old Aiken Hospital. Apartments would be so much better suited there. 
We can, we can, okay, we can even do a new hotel there. We can preserve this hotel as evidenced by Craig Bennett coming from, you know, Charleston, who's done it 50,000 times in Charleston. I think there is a rationale for keeping that hotel. Also, when I hear about traffic studies and taking over part of Newberry Street. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, now you're talking about moving up a block and taking part of that parkway. This is just the beginning of what will continue, and it goes, Project Pascalis, it may not be named that. Pascalis would have a cow and roll over in his grave. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Susan Tucker, and I live at 114 Ray Lane. To quote a very good friend here who's sitting in the other room, I really don't know beans. But what I do know is I love Aiken. And for that reason, I want to tell you about another charming small town that I love, that shared many of the same assets as Aiken. That town is Naples, Florida. Decisions have been made over the past seven and eight years that prioritize monetary benefits, which has turned and changed Naples forever. Yes, the beaches are still there. The Gulf of Mexico is still there. It's beautiful. The weather's fantastic. But the history, the charm, the sense of community are not there anymore. People are talking about leaving. Young people and older people are all sad and unhappy with what Naples has become. No longer are there sole proprietor shops or restaurants downtown. There are condos on Fifth Avenue, which is comparable to Warren Street here in Aiken. There are multi-story garages, too much traffic, and mostly missed the feeling of community. The assets that Naples has enjoyed proudly for decades are gone, and they'll never be recaptured. The changes being presented here today are physical changes. Those changes can impact far deeper than the physical aspects of Aiken. So it is incredibly important that change is embraced carefully. Moving forward is possible while protecting the past and the integral essence of your town. Yes, it's hard, but it takes time. And isn't it worth it? This town has so much to be proud of and so much to lose small town charm, history, and maybe even more importantly, a sense of community. Once those are gone, they're gone forever. Today, Naples has a new anthem. It's a song from the 70s. A pay paradise and put up a parking lot with a pink hotel and a boutique and a swinging hotspot. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Don't make that your anthem. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, our presentations ran about 10 minutes longer than we thought, so we've now added 20 minutes. Uh, members of this panel do have some commitments at 2 o'clock. So at this point, we will have another session. Uh, at 5.30 this afternoon, we've got the City Council work session at 7. Before you leave, I would like to ask those of you who are opposed generally to this site plan to stand and make that known at this time. Okay. All right, thank you. Those who are in favor, please stand and make that known. Thank you so much. Uh, this session is adjourned. Uh, hopefully we will see some of you at our 530 meeting.